This is July 18th, 2011. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. And with me is Tony Hilliard, who's also a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. And we're honored to have with us today at the History Center, Mr. Ed Woods. Uh, Ed is a Vietnam veteran, a Navy veteran, and he's kindly agreed to share his story with us in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, Ed, we really do appreciate you being here with us, and we're honored that you would take your time and come in and share your story with us. Thank you. Would you give us your complete name and current address? My complete name is Edward Augustus Woods, Jr. I live at 530 Oriole Farm Trail, Canton, Georgia. When and where were you born? I was born at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia in September the 17th, 1942. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Actually, I was raised on, in southeast Atlanta, uh, single parent. Uh, my daddy was a uh, World War II veteran, and he was away most of the time while I was, while I was a baby. Uh, not long after I was born, probably within two, three years, uh, him and mother divorced. Uh, and I was raised in a single parent home uh, with my mother and my grandmother and we didn't live very far, we lived on George Avenue which is not very far from what is now Turner Field. Uh, after, after through all of this uh, we left there and moved to, mother moved many times she was a mover, never liked to stay in one place, and uh, we lived uh, on south, in southwest Atlanta. That's where I grew up. Uh, I went to Brown High School, finished high school, enrolled in Southern Tech, and transferred from Southern Tech to Georgia Tech, went back and forth to, between the two schools, and uh, finally graduated from Southern Tech with two different degrees, and uh, in fact, I. Then after, while I was going to school was when I was initially drafted or got my draft notice and I decided this was not what I wanted to do. So I joined the, I was going to Georgia Tech at the time and I joined the uh, Navy Re Marine Reserve Unit on campus. Uh, actually it was on 5th Street which is no longer existent there. The campus has taken over the reserve unit. And uh, I joined the CBs. And little did I know at the time what a CB was, you know. I joined the Navy so I wouldn't get dirty. I just detested getting dirty. And uh, so I joined the Navy and uh, uh, I found out later what a CB was. I was attached to, when I was in country, I was attached to the 9th Marines and the 3rd Marines. So. I never was on a ship in my life, so I, I don't have a clue what that's like. And, well, at the outset, uh, tell us what a CB is. Well, uh, unless you are a fan of John Wayne or a former Marine, you don't know what a CB is. And uh, a CB is a person, uh, I, I call it, uh, we were the construction unit for the for the Marine Corps. And when the Marines went, went, went out, they had to have somebody, the Army had their Corps of Engineers, the Marine had Seabees. And we went out to the different Marine outfits and we built generally everything that they needed. We built their hardbacks, we built uh, their all their living quarters, their, their heads, their clubs, their dining halls, we built bridges. Uh, I even uh, helped build a morgue in Denain. Uh, everything that had to be done for them, we did it. And uh, sure, they had some marine engineering outfits, but I don't believe that they were construction outfits as per se. We did all of their construction work. I was a builder. Uh, I, when I went to Vietnam, I was a uh, third class builder. An E4 at the time. Now, when you went into the the group in college, did you 
want to go into the CBs, or did they just say you were going to? Uh, I, 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 no, I got my I got my draft letter, and um, so I knew this. I got my letter. Gosh, it had to be in '63, fall of '63, uh, and I was going to Georgia Tech at the time, and at Georgia Tech. Uh, to be considered full-time to stay out of the draft, you had to carry 12 hours. I was going to night school carrying 10 hours, which wasn't enough. And uh, so I went and joined. I, the, the word was you could join a unit, and then you would not be drafted. So I went and joined the Navy at the Navy Marine uh, Corps unit. And... Uh, at that time, I found out what a CB. I found out I was joining the CBs, and I still really didn't know what a CB was. Although at Tech, I was going to engineering school, so this fell in line with what I was doing. You know, I, I really didn't have an issue at all with that. I thought that would be a great thing to do, and and, and very honestly, uh, this is a part of why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. I feel like that. I think in, in, in the AVVBA, I think I'm possibly the only CB in there. I'm not sure, but I think I am, out of 200 some odd guys. And you just don't meet many people that were CBs. And yet we played an enormous part of the war. And uh, mostly in the I Corps area, uh, we, uh, to each battalion, there were CB teams that were acted like the uh, Peace Corps did a lot of, they were the military end of the Peace Corps. So, no, to answer your question, I really didn't know that's what I was joining, okay. and, and I really didn't honestly have a preference. Okay. When you got out of school, did you go right into the military? I wasn't, I was in the military when, I went in the military when I was in school, and uh, the military interrupted my school, and uh, so in, it, I had to leave school. Uh, I was in the reserve unit for two years. And at that time, I was in the reserve unit. I still went to school. And I, I was working for uh, uh, the city of Atlanta as a uh, draftsman. They called them civil engineers, but they were far from civil engineers. They were draftsmen. And I was working for the water department. And so uh, joining the CB sort of fell in line with that. That was fine. And uh, I stayed there two years, going to active, spending the time in active duty. Went to boot camp at this time, went to Great Lakes, and uh, spent my time at Great Lakes and came back home. Took a train ride. That, most people don't never take a train ride, but I rode the train from Atlanta to Chicago and then, and then back, you know. And uh, it was a good experience. And then after two years of uh, active reserve, I went on active duty. Okay. During all of this time, I still had not finished school. Okay. During that time, were you keeping up with what was going on in Vietnam pretty closely? Um, yeah and, and no, okay. Uh, we had, uh, we, I got married, uh, went on active reserves in 64. I got married in uh, April of 65. Still married the same woman. Congratulations. Uh, so uh, we, you know, no, we had too many other things going on. You know, I, I was a part of, uh, I had joined the uh, uh, Ben Hill JCs, which was a, an organization in southwest Atlanta at the time. And we had a speaker that had just returned from Vietnam. Okay. And uh, so that was really my first interaction. Uh, in fact, one of the comments he made, you know, this was early, very early. This was like he had gone over in 64, 65, and uh, uh, he made a comment when, when you start getting shot at, you disperse because the, the, the Vietnamese couldn't shoot straight and they were afraid they'd hit a target other than what they were shooting at. So. I do remember that, but other than that, no, it wasn't involved, you know, it, it just something that sure. I joined the Navy, and you know, the Navy don't go to war country, you know. <laughs> you thought 
<laughs> I thought, yeah, that's true. Talk about your training and where you were, what you were being trained to specifically do, any experiences you want to share? Well, other, other than uh, uh, my uh, boot camp training, uh, we did a little bit of training at, at the reserve unit. We spent, uh, uh, I spent two weeks at the uh, SEAL base in, in Norfolk. We went up there and we trained with uh, an amphibious CB group. Uh, there was two times, two kind of uh, CB groups. One was construction and one was amphibious. And uh, we trained with the amphibious group at the time. And we did, we, little did I realize at the time what was going on. We, we, we went out, we spent uh, one of the weekends, we spent the weekend there going out on a ship and then turning around and, and attacking the beach in Norfolk, you know. I just remember being cold and wet, and I didn't like no part of that either, you know. So, uh, but when I left, when I left there, I uh, came back home, and we did a lot of volunteer work in and around Atlanta on our on our weekend meetings. We would we did a lot of volunteer work at uh, uh, ball fields, ball camps, people that particularly in indigent areas where the kids and the parents really didn't have the money yeah. to do fix the ball fields, fix the clubhouses or whatever. We did that. Uh, and when I first went on active duty, January of uh, 66, I went to Davisville, Rhode Island. And Davisville, Rhode Island was a uh, uh, Class A before we went to school, went to A school there. It was a, it was a CB base. There were a few battalions based out of Davisville, Rhode Island. But for the most part, it was where you went and did your your class A school in the rate that you were trained in. Now, mine was a builder. I learned construction work at the time. I learned how to build the different things. I learned what you should and what you shouldn't do. Uh, there were also many rates in, in uh, uh, plumbers, pipe fitters, electricians, steel workers, mechanics. All of these were CB rates. Uh, and that school lasted for uh, January, February, March. We left. We left there uh, first of March, and uh, and then that's when I was assigned. I found out I was assigned what battalion I was assigned to, and where at. Okay. After uh, after I found out where I was assigned to, came home, flew back home. By the way, that was the first time I'd ever flown an airplane either. It was flying from Atlanta to. Uh, Portsmouth, uh, not Portsmouth, Providence, Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, and then flying back. But uh, my wife and I, uh, uh, she was still living in Atlanta and um, had, a, had a little small bedroom apartment off of uh, out southwest Atlanta. And we, uh, during that time, I knew I was getting ready to go to Vietnam, or I knew I was getting ready to go to California. At that time, I didn't know I was going to Vietnam. Uh, we did, we did. My, my family, which was consisted of my mother and my grandmother, and knew very little about my father at the time. Uh, we did some things, uh, like, like for an example, uh, we attended the very first Braves game played here. Uh, and when I flew into Atlanta, we flew over the uh, stadium and they were playing an exhibition game against the Yankees. So I was able to see that was sort of neat. And then the next night, my wife and I attended the very first Braves game, which they opened up against Pittsburgh Power, played 13 innings, and still lost the ball game. But uh, we still have the program, and, you know, I rummage back through and see these things occasionally. But after that, then we, we, uh, we bought a little uh, Volkswagen, and uh, we packed it up, packed a trailer, attached it to the Volkswagen, to California I went, you know. And, uh, when was that? Pardon? When was that? 1966, April 66. Then uh, we drove from uh, Atlanta to New Orleans. We really made a fun trip out of it. Went from Atlanta to New Orleans to Dallas. Somewhere in Texas, Oklahoma, we got on Route 66. Had to do that at the time. 
We wound up at uh, uh, Grand Canyon, spent the night at Grand Canyon. And uh, oddly enough, we, uh, we had uh, dinner that night with Tom Brokaw. Oh. He just happened to be at Grand Canyon, and he was doing working for WSB at the time in Atlanta. He had just left Atlanta. He saw our Georgia plates, and we got to talking and, and met him, okay, oh. just by coincidence. He came out and introduced himself to us. He was on his way to a... Uh, a job in Los Angeles, I believe KNBC at the time. So anyway, we left there and then uh, drove on into uh, Los Angeles that afternoon, that night, and then on up into uh, uh, Port Wyneme. And Port Wyneme is on the uh, coast of uh, California, uh, just right outside of Oxnard, and uh, a little bit north of Point Magoo. And, um, we rented a little uh, two-bedroom apartment, no money other than what is our military pay, because she wasn't working at the time, didn't have a job, and so we rented a little two-room apartment. The bedroom and the bathroom were in one room, and the kitchen and the living area and everything was in the other room. So uh, in two weeks, I, w I was assigned to MCB-10, uh, Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 10, and uh, it was scheduled to go back on a second tour of Vietnam. They just returned from a tour of Vietnam. In fact, 10 was the uh, first CB battalion in Vietnam. They did a, uh, a beach landing outside of Chu Lai. But uh, when they were getting ready to go, they had, it, it came to their attention that myself as well as few other guys had not had any combat training, or rifle training, or anything. So they went on ahead and left, and uh, we stayed back for a month or so and did extra additional training. And we flew from, uh, see, where did we fly? We flew from Point Magoo. We boarded a uh, four-engine prop plane, Navy prop plane. And we flew from, uh, Point Magoo to uh, San Francisco, from San Francisco to Hawaii, from Hawaii to Guam, no, from Hawaii to Wake, and then from Wake to Guam, and then into Da Nang, which is where Tin was. And we flew into Da Nang, flew into Da Nang at night. And uh, it just happened to fly over a firefight. There was a firefight going on under us, and uh, that was the first firefight I'd ever seen. And it was really fascinating, you know. You, you don't know. It's a brand new experience, you know. So we landed at Da Nang at night, and I got off the plane. This was in the middle of uh, 1st of July, somewhere along in there. Extremely hot. And we got on what I would call a cattle car. Bunch of us got on cattle car, couldn't sit down, you know, you're standing up. And uh, they drove us to the uh, uh, base, which happened to be a place called Camp Hoover. And Camp Hoover was uh, just west of Da Nang. It was close enough you could see the airstrip and hear the, the, the planes come in and out all day. Uh, but yet we were far enough away. and. Uh, so we stayed there. I, my first tour, my first assignment there was, uh, well, first couple of days I filled sandbags, filled bags, you know, bag, bags. And I was just a little guy, so I, this was hard work. This was not what I wanted to do. So, <laughs> and, and so after that, they assigned me to a, uh, 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 guard duty. And, uh, when I did the guard duty, I was on the southwest corner of the camp, and they told me what I was supposed to do. Nobody was supposed to pass by me at all. It was a corner. It wasn't an entrance to the camp, but it was a corner protection. So uh, I did that job fairly well. I mean, they heard my voice down at, when they was watching movies at night, you know, and I was hollering, halt, you know. <laughs> Whoever come around, tell them to halt, you know. Yeah. But I saw, uh, I could see the airstrip, from, from, it was an elevated uh, base, 
elevated uh, station, and I could see the air base, and uh, I had a uh, radio, and I could hear the either the pilot or the base talking one or the other. Couldn't as oddly, I don't know what it was. I'm not a, familiar with it, what's going on, but you could only hear one of them. You couldn't hear the pilot. At the same time, you could hear the bass, but I think I was listening to the bass. And I saw a lot of interesting things fly in and out of the air. You know, you, at the time, the uh, South Vietnamese had prop planes. They didn't have any jets. They had prop planes, and they flew in and out. Also, uh, the Marines had uh, a lot of air, air power. They flew in and out, as well as the Air Force. And they each had their own unique airplanes. The Marines had the uh, F-4C Phantoms which just screamed when they came in. And uh, I never understood at the time, uh, but they always, always flew in from the south, flew over the airstrip, come back around west, and flew south right straight over us, and made, then the, after they circled the airstrip, then they landed. Uh, you know, I understand that it was to make sure that there was nothing going on at the base at the time. But anyway, we... Uh, after about a month of guard duty, I was assigned to Charlie Company. When Charlie Company was a company made up of uh, builders, of my people of my own rate, and there were some steel workers in Charlie Company as well. Uh, but we went out on many different assignments, out on a lot of different outposts, Marine outposts. Uh, uh, particularly, it was one that I remember fairly well. Uh, we went to a scout dog camp, a sentry and scout dog camp, where they needed some construction work relief to going on, and, and we did that. And I, and I got to watch them work. And that, this is where one time uh, we got hit personally. You know, we got shot at several times while we was up on the, the things. And uh, not really a lot of effective fire work. But we built all of their outfits, their heads, they needed showers, they needed places, because this was like a, as I learned later in the service, this, nothing's permanent. And, but these were what we would call their permanent bases. Uh, a lot of places I went to, uh, uh, we went to Quang Tree, we went to, uh, uh, gosh, let me give me a minute right here. Uh, we, we would get up and leave about 6 o'clock in the morning and not return till 6 o'clock at night uh, on, what, two-ton trucks, whatever it was we called them at the time. And, uh, Deuce and a half. Pardon? Deuce and a half. Deuce and a half. Deuce and a half. I drove one one time, and I made a mistake driving. I'll never do that again. Uh, the driver was responsible for flat tires. I got back. They go around kicking the tires one night. Inside rear tires flat. I didn't get to see the movie. I didn't get to eat. <laughs> I'm sitting there changing the tire by myself. But uh, uh, also, uh, we built a morgue. We built a morgue in Da Nang. And to build a morgue, we had to build a, uh, uh, it was on the other side of a small creek that ran between the roadway and where it was building the morgue. I was responsible for building that what I guess would be a causeway to go across. We had to build a uh, concrete tunnel and sides, you know, whatever, and, and for a place for the creek to run. Uh, we built the amphitheater in Denying, a 5,000 seat amphitheater in Denying where uh, Bob Hope, Martha Godfrey came. And fortunately, I was glad enough to, to see that. Wow. Uh, it wasn't long after he was there, he was there in December 66, and of course in late January 67 is when we returned back to stateside. Uh, we built the library, the 3rd Marine Force. Also, uh, uh, we did uh, odd work like uh, headquarters. Uh, gosh, I can't think of what the guys was, what his rank was. be on some big White House in denying we had to paint that got paint all over us, but you know, it was just something to do and keep us busy. And all of this had to be done in 130 degree weather as well as monsoon weather. I mean, there was no stopping. You stopped. 
uh, the Marines had, uh, at the Denying Airstrip, they had their aircraft, and their aircraft wasn't protected. Uh, if, if, a, if they got, took in rounds, those rounds could destroy two, three, or four aircraft at the same time. One round could. So we went in and we built revetments. The revetments is nothing, no more than a, a steel panel. It looks like something you see on the side of the interstate now to protect neighborhoods from noise abatement. Yeah. But we built these, and these were like, you know, eight, ten feet high, um, possibly a foot thick, and, and they ran the length of the airplane, which was, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50 feet long. And we built those, and they were like parking areas for them to park their jets as well as the uh, helicopters at the time. Uh, then on occasionally, we, we worked for six and a half days a week. On uh, Sunday afternoon, we were, it was, Sunday afternoon was free, and we had stakes. Sunday afternoon was a stake time, and it, and you tried to figure out every way in the world you could to get two stakes, you know. But the, the cooks generally watched that. Occasionally you could come up with a way, but we did, we, you know, we had a good meal. And uh, about once a month, uh, we'd, uh, a company would pack up and off to China Beach they'd go. We'd, we'd leave and, and go spend the day at China Beach. And there really is a China Beach. Uh, not just like the TV series, it was a China Beach. And we'd spend the day out there. They'd provide us with uh, steaks out there, cooking out there, or hot dogs, or whatever the case may be, or beer. Yeah. It was our R&R. &R. Describe China Beach. Beautiful. China Beach was absolutely beautiful. Uh, very wide, real white. Uh, there's a, uh, I've got a, a slide with me at China Beach which shows from the waist up extremely brown, from the waist down extremely white. Uh, in fact, my daughter commented last night when we was looking at it, she said, Dad, you have white legs. I said, honey, that's fine. You know, during when we worked, we worked without shirts. Yeah. Didn't wear shorts at the time, so. Uh, but China Beach was uh, was gorgeous. It really was, and uh, uh, it's probably one of the prettiest beaches I've ever been on, including what right here. And, yeah. uh, and I've been to other places, other other islands, and they were beautiful. But China Beach was just a gorgeous beach, absolutely pretty. Uh, as most members of the service that served in Vietnam, they don't talk a lot about Vietnam. Uh, I talk very seldom about it. This is, I, I really appreciate what's going on here because I have the opportunity to express myself. And what we, I, you know, I, I didn't see a lot of action. I got shot at and yet I had to shoot at, okay? But in denying, it was sort of a, uh, a, a closed place. It was a large military, you know, People there, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of military, army, uh, marines, air force. Uh, I do remember this was fascinating, and this would be good for all your air force guys that watch this. I enjoyed working at the marine, at the airstrip, okay, because we would use the air force facilities, and they had flushing commodes. <laughs> I had not seen a flushing commode in like three or four months, and I sit there, I played with the handle all, you know, as long as I was in there, because I'd never seen one. You know, what is this? This is neat. But uh, that I enjoyed. Uh, I did have to go to, uh, I can't think of what the marine terminology for it was, uh, but I, from the MASH TV series, I, it was a MASH unit to me. A hospital? A medical unit? A medical hospital. Charlie Med, NSA. Something like that, yeah, Charlie Med. You know, I had to go over there one day and do some work. And uh, they brought in a helicopter. Mm -hmm. And everybody was excited about this helicopter. Hurry up and get the nurses over here and whatever, you know. And then they called it all off. Uh, there was nothing but uh, deceased personnel, dead, dead people on the helicopter yeah. in, in body bags. Yeah. I didn't like that. That was not. Yeah. That, that just gives you another side of Vietnam. In uh, late January uh, 67, we left Vietnam. We, we packed up and left. MCB-4 replaced us. A battalion, a Navy CB battalion, was 
I liken it to a Navy ship. It goes out for nine months at the time and comes back for six months. It goes out for nine months, comes back for six. I don't believe they do that now. I think they do a six and six type bill. When was it left? Pardon? When was it left? When did you leave Vietnam? Pack up your January of 67 I left, uh, which then scheduled us to come back in late July, early August. Uh, but the battalion, the, the reason I'm bringing up the battalion that replaced us, during our time I do not recall any medical casualties, okay? Uh, combat casualties. To say combat casual on our battalion but a guy that uh, was with me at my reserve unit at Tech in, here in Atlanta and joined he was assigned to MCB4 that replaced us uh, he was killed in March of 67 uh, him and uh, two of his buddies were killed in a jeep going to the ammo dump and I remember the ammo dump well they hit a road mine, killed them. And, and, and I just, I find that we went through, this, 800 guys of us went through this, nothing, no combat injuries to speak of, and yet immediately three of them were killed. Yeah. His name was Larry Ray Riddle. I, I remember him well, and it, but he was younger. The, the thing that, about Vietnam, to me, I was older than a lot of the enlisted guys I was with. Uh, I was like 23, 24, and most of them were 17, 18, 19 years old, you know. And, and so a lot of times I was called the old man, you know. Yeah. But uh, not meaning that I was responsible or in charge. I was an enlisted man. I was an E-4. And because uh, I had not yet finished college, not done any of that. When, when I got back from, uh, when we left Vietnam in January 67, we landed at uh, Naval Magoo, Naval Air Station, Point Magoo, Carolina, I mean, uh, California, sorry. And uh, there my wife met us, and uh, as all the families did, because we were so close to Oxnard. And we stayed, we stayed right there, and uh, uh, we, we left uh, California and came back to Atlanta for my 30-day my leave, uh, and then went back. Uh, and it, it, I have to say this, that during my first tour, we did not take r and R. I did not, I chose not to take r and R. And uh, so we went through this whole time without seeing or being with my wife. Yeah. Uh, we did, I did, however, when I was, uh, in my first four or six weeks I was in, in country, uh, I had gotten to be close friends with a, uh, the radio operator and uh, he was able to patch me through to her. We were, there was a 12 hour difference. She was at the Bank of America. She went and got her job at the Bank of America in Oxnard and they patched me through to her there. Uh, but he did tell me, he said, now Ed, if we get hit in any way, I gotta shut you down. And it was about two or three minutes we got hit. Not a lot, but we got hit. He immediately had to shut us down. So unlike today where you've got the internet, you've got the ability to talk uh, to your wife, cell phones, whatever. We didn't have that in Vietnam, which was, we were even far better shaped than our predecessors in World War II and Korea. They didn't even have that. And they were gone longer. So, you know, I, I feel very fortunate just to be able to do that. But, uh, uh, Carol, she's like I said, she went to work for for Bank of America in Oxnard. And uh, can, can I get a glass of water? Sure. Okay. Here, you want to stop for a minute? Yeah, you wish. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, during the time that I was in, in, in country, first time, Carol went to work for uh, Bank of America and became a teller. So she stayed active and stayed busy there in, in Southern California. Uh, met some other people that was, some wives of people that were in MCV-10 as well. Uh, she went to work uh, there and they shipped her for a week up to uh, uh, San Luis Obispo, California, where she worked with opening a new branch up there for the uh, Cal Poly State University. Uh, you know, she was able to stay busy. 
She also uh, uh, rented a, a little bit nicer apartment, got us out of the two bedroom, out of the two room apartment into a single bedroom apartment, and that was nice with a pool and all of that. So uh, while we were there in California uh, during our uh, uh, home tour, uh, we were able to go to uh, uh, Los, uh, Los Angeles. We spent some time in Hollywood doing what I would call the tourist thing looking at tourist homes. We were sitting at a stop sign one day trying to figure out just where we were. And the side just pulls up Rock Hudson. And uh, uh, we followed him for a little while and finally he turned off from somebody else's driveway. But we did these odd things. We, we went to some, what we thought at the time were nice restaurants in, in Los Angeles, the Brown Derby, you know, just to go. Yeah, we didn't have the monies, but we, we managed to scrape up money to do these things. We went to a lot of Braves games while we were there, and um, because we we were both very big Braves fans, and uh, still are, in fact. Uh, we spent a lot of time training at the base. We, uh, uh, we spent a weekend at, uh, at, at a place called Conejo Grade, which was a, uh, a mountain outpost where you did underwent combat training. Uh, they had everything set up and rigged where uh, you were to fight a, another enemy. Uh, uh, some people today would call it paintball fights or whatever, but we actually had to, uh, you know, fight and, and come up with just a lot of different stuff. It, it, was, it wasn't fun either, and it was in the middle of the heat too. Uh, we uh, spent a week at uh, Camp Pendleton, we went down to Camp Pendleton Marine Base and spent a week down there. And and one thing I noticed at the time, the Marine recruits at Pendleton didn't have the M16. I, I thought this was interesting. This was in uh, in 1967. Uh, and they questioned us on our M16s. We had 16s and they didn't. Uh, surely to goodness they got the 16s afterwards, I'm sure. Uh, my mother and my grandmother visited us when we was in California and we were able to take them to Disneyland and, and to Universal City Studios or whatever. We did that and, and, and they both really enjoyed that. And there was a, a little pizza place we went to generally every Friday and Saturday night where you could sit, had long tables and it was like a community. And I remember uh, St. Patty's, they had, we had green beer and, and, and darn if we didn't have green pizza, you know. Everything was green, but we had fun. This was just, yeah. it was, we were young, and yeah. that's what we did. We didn't have a lot of money. Gosh, no, you don't get paid a lot, you know, and and when I was in country, you know, I didn't get any money. I, it was all shipped back to her, you know. I think I had like $12, $13 a month to live off of, and that was for things that uh, I could buy at the uh, uh, soap or whatever, toothpaste, or that I needed. Uh, in late July, early August, we were uh, scheduled to return to Vietnam. And in the process of being boarding up and getting ready to go to Vietnam, we didn't go to Vietnam. We went to uh, Okinawa instead. And uh, I don't know if this was a part of the original deal or not. But uh, anyway, we stayed at a place called Camp Kinzer, which was in, uh, I believe, northwest Okinawa. We stayed there for six weeks, and during this time, we spent a lot of time uh, rebuilding things that needed. A lot of it was rotten because there was a lot of high humidity, and and they needed a lot of work. Marines needed a lot of work at that place too. But in on the fun side of it, we also spent a lot of time on BC Street. So, at, Tony, you've been to BC Street? Uh, yes. Okay. So. <laughs> You can tell us whatever you'd like to about B.C. Street. B.C. Street was a fun place. You go from one bar to the next. And it was interesting because you'd see the same people no matter where you went. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, uh, at one of the local restaurants my wife and I went to, I uh, ran into a guy that was in the Air Force, a young guy, and he had just got back from v, uh, Okinawa. I said, did you go to B.C. Street? Me and he became long, fast friends, you know. But... Uh, we, we left Camp Kinzer and we went into uh, uh, Quang Tree. And uh, then we drove north through Dong Hai, through Wei, 
and we went west uh, to Camp Carroll. Camp Carroll was a, uh, a marine base uh, like uh, uh, it, it was it was sort of round is what I would call it optical or whatever but it had an army artillery base in the center of it excuse me and the army had the 175 artillery the Marines had the 105 and the 155s also with the Marines the Marines at Camp Carroll the Marines this was used as a stopover point for some of the grunt units, uh, uh, sniper units. These were people that didn't stay long at a camp, but they did need maybe a two or three, four day R and R for them. Okay, this was a place that they came in. They we had a we built a small chapel for them to worship. We built a nice dining hall. We built. Uh, 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 clubs, uh, enlisted men's club, and we built a uh, uh, an officers club. We uh, uh, spent a lot of time going out from from uh, Camp Carroll. Didn't go far because it was extremely hostile. Uh, we we could see the DMZ from Carroll. Camp Carroll was named after a Marine captain that was killed. I believe he was killed in '66, defending the area. It was that was known as Operation Prairie before it became Camp Carroll. But Carroll was a uh, it was high on a hill. We could see the Indian Ocean from where we were. We could see the DMZ where we, were. we could see North Vietnam where we were. Uh, one outfit place that we could see extremely well was Conti Inn, which was a uh, uh, a marine base like about three miles from us that was under constant barrage, uh, constant fighting. And uh, we could see the, at night, you couldn't see it during the day, but at night you could see the uh, cruisers, Navy cruisers and in the Indian Ocean firing in support of Contien and firing into the DMZ and firing into North Vietnam. That, that was really interesting to see that. Uh, we also was was able to see a lot of B-52 raids, uh, and, and that is, you hate to use the word magnificent, but that was the most incredible form of firepower that you will ever see. And occasionally you could see the plane, barely, but you could see a glimmer of the plane and all of a sudden for miles just bombardment, you know, boom, 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 just, you know, how anybody no matter how deep their their cave was, how they survived that, I'll never know. A uh, short story on B-52 raids. Uh, they were dropping a B-52 raid in support of Contien, and it happened to be between us and Contien. That was very, very close. That woke us up that night. Uh, it's just loud. I mean, you know, you just, you just hold your head and you bounce like you're in an earthquake and knowing what it is but there's nothing you can do about it yeah. and you just have to wait and survive that. Uh, not far from us was a, uh, at the time, a little known place called Quezon, uh, which in the latter part of 67 became very well known. Uh, Quezon was a, uh, air, had an airstrip as well as an artillery base and it fired in support of Contien. <coughs> on an occasion, we would receive a short round. From it, they were on one side of us. They would fire over us, and we would receive a short round from uh, Quezon. Not a lot of damage, but we did get it. The reason the uh, I found this very interesting in, in, in a lot of research I did, the Army had the 175s. 175s could fire, fire about 22, 23 miles. The Marines had the 155s, which couldn't fire but maybe 13, 14, 15 miles. The North Vietnamese could fire, their artillery could fire 20 miles. So the Army was taking the 175s to a base other than Carroll 
And during this time, it was decided they were going to put the 175s at Carroll because the Marines couldn't fire as far as the North Vietnamese could fire. So they brought those in and counteracted the North Vietnamese artillery. Also not very far from us was a place called the Rock Pile, uh, which was a Marine base at the time. But there were like 10 or 12 bases along the DMZ, anywhere from like three to four miles south of the DMZ, all the way across the northern i area. Carroll was one of them, Quezon was one, Rock Pile was one, Contien was one. Uh, and these were all Marine controlled bases. And uh, we fired, we, we, I guess that's why I still got a ringing in my ears from, from the artillery. It was constant, one right after the other. Uh, the, and Carroll was the command post for the 3rd Marine Regiment. And I, you know, you just, as, as, as a ditch digger like I was, you know, you don't know these things, and, but that's where the headquarters was for the 3rd Marine Regiment at the time. Uh, we worked 12 hours a day. We worked seven days a week. We didn't get any time off. And this was included the monsoons, included the heat. And when we first got to Camp Carroll, there was no hardbacks. Uh, hardback being a 16 by 32. Uh, all they lived in was uh, something for anywhere from putt tents on up. They did have 16 by 32 tents, but they were all supported by just wooden posts. So we went in and built I can't even begin to tell you how many, countless number of 16 by 32s. Then we took the uh, uh, tent and stretch over that, and then that became their living quarters. Marine. They had at least had a dry floor to stay on. They uh, uh, had, you know, they had dry eating quarters. They had dry facilities, you know, and it, this was important to them. It's, this was for the guys that had been out in the field. This wasn't for the guys stationed there. And these guys that had gone out for three or four months at a time and come back, they needed a place to dry, take a shower, eat some reasonable food. And uh, th this was important to us. Uh, we, built, uh, we built all of their eating quarters. Uh, I, I can't even begin to tell you what all with their heads. Uh, I remember uh, one day I had to use the facility. It was nothing no more than a one place like what we remember growing up as kids in, in Appalachia, it was like a outhouse. It just happened to be under a 155, and he was shooting. That wasn't that wasn't any fun at either. You know, you come flying out of there about the time he lets go. You know, uh, in in December of '67, uh, Charlie Company was sent to Quezon. Uh That was my company. I was not sent to Quezon. I was removed from uh, Charlie Company at the time. They were sent. And, and the reason that I have since found out why was I was scheduled to get out. Uh, they knew that once you were sent to Quezon, you were not leaving for two months. Two, Quezon was under siege for 67 straight days. Uh, airplanes could not land at Quezon. They came in and on a roll, they would drop their equipment for the, for the guys that were there, the Marine, the Army. They would drop their equipment and never stop. they just throw it right out the back door and in. Uh, I lost a few good friends at Quezon. Uh, my first class petty officer, he died at Quezon. Uh, during this time, uh, before, just before they were told where they were going, I was offered uh, an E-5 promotion, second class. I turned it down because I was scheduled to get out. Uh, and I, they told me that uh, I would have to stay in the Navy another year to get that. And I said, no, I, I, I've done, this is my second tour, I'm done, okay? Plus, as soon as I got back to the reserve unit, I knew that I would get that second class petty officer, which I did. Uh, Quezon wasn't declared safe until uh, 1968, February of 1968. And I will say this for the benefit of my company that went during the time that they spent at Quezon, they were 
awarded the presidential unit citation. Uh, we had already received the Navy unit citation, uh, the battalion did, as well as the letter E. Uh, but they had received the presidential, which I was extremely proud and would have loved to have received, but yeah. I did not get it. Uh, I left December in 67, and uh, oddly enough, we're lining up all these guys to board planes. We were loading on a commercial jet, uh, the big gold tail continental jet. I was one of the last three or four to get on, so I rode first class all the way back. You know, didn't get first class service, but you had a big, nice leather seat, you know. Uh, and when I landed at Carroll, I mean, landed in Los Angeles, met Carol, uh, my wife, it was snowing. This was December of 67 and it was snowing and I can't remember the base that we landed. It was a military base outside of Los Angeles. I can't remember. I've tried to research it and I can't remember. She had everything packed and we left there and we came back to Atlanta. And I have to say that, you know, when I got back to Atlanta, uh, Nobody, as Tony and I talked earlier, nobody, being from the South, I wasn't treated rough. I wasn't treated harsh. I was just treated as a guy, you know. And I'd, I'd heard all the stories about my friends that went back to the Northeast or those that landed in California and lived there. They were treated, you know, I was treated no different. And uh, uh, so I really can't attest to anything else like that. When I got back, I uh, reported to uh, the Naval Air Station in Atlanta, which was in Marietta. And uh, from there, I exited in December, uh, let's see, where was it? December of the, uh, gosh, I can't even think 67. of it. Uh, December of 67. And yeah, December 21st, I exited the Navy on December 21st, 67, and went back to the reserve unit at that time. And I stayed on reserves, active reserves, for two more years. And during that time, we did uh, uh, things like community service work. We did a lot of community service work in and around in Atlanta. I had to go on uh, active duty for two weeks during the summer. Uh, and we spent that two weeks in Gulfport, Mississippi. So, uh, you know, I, I was, I did, I did a lot of things and. I was awarded uh, no hero medals, as I would call it, uh, but I did get, you know, I did. I was awarded the Navy Unit Accommodation with two stars. I got the Navy Meritorious Unit. I got the Navy E Ribbon. Got the Navy Reserve Meritorious. Of course, I got the Naval, uh, the National Defense with one Bronze Star, Vietnam Service Medal, which I'm really proud of that because it had the Fleet Marine Force on it with three bronze with stars. I got the uh, RVM uh, MUC uh, uh, Gallantry Cross with the Palm, the Civil Actions Medal, and of course the RVM Campaign Medal. All of this was done, uh, which I can say proudly was done as a unit, because we served as a unit. Uh, we did have the CBs did have people that did a lot of exemplary work. There, if you if you research it, the uh, it was a CB that won the Medal of Honor before a Marine won the Medal of Honor. Uh, that was uh, Hoover, I believe his name was, or Marvin Sh Marvin Shields. Won the he was a uh, part of a, uh, 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 a battalion uh, camp. I'm trying to think of the word. He was. Like we talked about earlier, these uh, uh, company they went out and they served in the in the community of Vietnam, teaching them how to run water, get power. Yeah. And he was Marvin Shields was was killed. That uh, I really don't have a lot else. I mean, I could probably go on unless you got some questions. I do have a couple of questions going back to your time in country. Did you ever have an opportunity to deal with many of the Vietnamese civilians? Uh, we had a lot of Vietnamese work on our outfits, yes. Uh, I was somewhat very apprehensive 
I didn't get close to them because stories were rampant about them, you know, carrying bombs or whatever with them to blow up. Uh, so I didn't get close, but yes, we did have them. Uh, they would come on, on our base and uh, uh, spend time working on our base, loading, unloading lumber. They, they did very menial work. Uh, would they, they were the ones that uh, oddly uh, washed our uniforms, uh, gave us haircuts. You know, when we were out in the field, yeah, we had a barber shop there on the base, on the camp, but yet when we were out in the field, you, you, you did take the time to, to do this if you could. Yeah. Uh, uh, but no, I, I, I interacted a little bit, but I, I, was, I stayed away from it. Right. It was just something I chose to do. And, uh, I don't know, I'm real proud of my service. And someone asked me uh, one time, would I have joined the service had I not got the draft notice? I can't answer that question because I don't know. That was a long time ago, another place, another time. But I can tell you this right now, and I'll say this very emphatically, I'm damn glad I would. Well, we're glad you did too. And you should be very proud of your service. I was real proud. I was real proud. I'm, I'm proud to uh, to have been and been a part of it. Uh, I was telling Tony earlier. Uh, uh, I've done a lot of research, particularly since uh, I volunteered to do this. Uh, <clears throat> but they were family members in my family that have served in every war since they crossed the pond from England to come here, uh, with the exception of Korea. And it was by happenstance of age that no one served in Korea. Uh, I had a, uh, if you will let me elaborate just. I would like you to. Uh, my father was in World War II, landed in uh, Normandy, went across France up and into the Rhineland, as they called it at that time, on the Great Ball, uh, Red Ball Express. Mm -hmm. He was an engineer in the Army. My grandfather was in World War I. My second great-grandfather was a, a Civil War, uh, served in the South Carolina Regiment. Can't ask you, answer the question at all why he was in South Carolina. I don't know. Maybe he got drunk and got lost and was in the <laughs> wrong state. I don't know. <laughs> My fourth great-grandfather was in the War of 1812. Another fourth great-grandfather was a naval officer in the Revolutionary War. Fifth great-grandfather was at Yorktown. Uh, my, another fifth great-grandfather was a part of the South Carolina Patriots in the Revolutionary War. A ninth great-grandfather was in this was even before the Revolutionary War. He was in Bacon's Rebellion, which was a, a, a small skirmish in Virginia. And they had a disagreement over what the Indians would get and what the Indians wouldn't get. My wife also had a few odd, odds and ends. She had fourth great-grandfather and a fifth great-grandfather was in the Revolutionary War. And had a tenth great-grandfather which was in the European War called the Thirty-Year War. So. I feel like uh, I'm just excuse me. I know, go right ahead. But I feel like I'm just a part of of what went on, and uh, you know, I hope that none of my kids. We 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 are expecting right now a great grandson, a grandson. Yeah, not a great, but a grandson. Hope that he doesn't have to do what I had to do. You know, and so you know. Excuse me, but that's no. one thing I love is is I love my God, my family, my country, and uh, I get emotional. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry at all. I mean, you, 
it's it's a real honor for us to be able to sit here with you and hear this story. You should but, be proud of everything you've done. Yeah, my ass didn't get shot at, but I felt like we did what had to be done. Yeah. I don't have anything else. Well, that's a wonderful story, and we want to thank you for what you did for your country. You you say you weren't in much danger, but you were in danger. You were you were in a lot of very hot spots in Vietnam. It was the second tour. We were in, yeah. we're in the second tour I was. First and, tour uh, no. The job you did made life a little bit easier for the men who were going to be living in those structures and utilizing what you built. So you, you should, uh, you played a big part in Vietnam and, and in the military. And we're, again, very honored to have had you here. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we close the no. interview? I really can't think of anything else to say. I just I appreciate the opportunity to. The CBs, the CBs are very important to me, and I felt like this was an opportunity to get out what a CB is. Not too many people know. Like I said one time before, John Wayne and the Marines know what a CB is. Yeah. You don't know who John Wayne is, and you, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know. But that's just. I, I didn't know myself until I became one, and I'm an ardent fan. I, I still stay in, uh, oddly enough, I've got uh, two buddies I stay in close contact with on email that I was in the service with, that I was in, in country with, same battalion, and, and we stay in communication at least once or twice a day. Okay. And uh, so I told them what I was doing, and uh, they were both... Uh, they wanted to help me, you know, yeah. stories, you know, yeah. one story after another. So uh, I'm real glad. Maybe when I get this, I can send them a copy of right. what we did, you know. Well, anybody that watches this will know what a CB did, and, and you should be very proud that you've spread the word, and thank you for your service. Okay. Thank you.